Bruce says this, I'll do whatever you say. Okay, real quick, let me talk to the kids. Where are they? Raise your hand if you're a child living in a home with your parents. Put it up in the air. Go ahead. All right, listen to me right now. If you never listened to me before, listen now. Fifth commandment in the, ten t- the top ten, or the big, the big ten, the, what, the ten commandments, is to honor who? Your father and your mother. And it comes with a promise. Why? So that it will go well for you where? In the land. So it will go well for you in your life. God said, right after he got done talking about how important it was to honor him and esteem him in with the first four commandments and the fifth commandment, he says, hey, children, obey your parents, honor them, listen to them. And he did that because in God's system, he sends his wisdom through your parents so that you can walk where he wants you to walk. Now, some of you are sitting there being like, really? I'm just not sure that's true, Mark. Because my parents are the dumbest people I know. (laughs) I was you once, I felt the same things. I can share with you that every year I get older, my parents get smarter. Not that they're any smarter, it's just I realized they knew what they were talking about when they were saying what they were saying. So I'm here to tell you as your pastor, as someone who loves you, and as someone who wants to hold up the story of Ruth for you as a template for your life. Ruth had a choice. She was in this situation where Naomi was recommending some things that were way outside the box. They were tell- she was telling her to go places where she had never gone before. But Ruth, loving her mother, trusting her mother, and seeing her mother as the agent of God in her life for the direction that her life was meant to go, said, I'll do whatever you say. And we're going to find out, oddly enough, that because she doesn't rebel against her mother's wisdom, that because she doesn't turn her head and and speak poorly of her to her friends when she's out. Because she honors her and esteems her, God does bring about the results that she desires and rescues her from the mess that she's in. Everybody here who's got a parent, not just the little kids, but all of us who got the older folks, remember to esteem your parents. God works through them, even when you don't think he is. All right. She went down to the threshing floor, it says in verse 8, and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. And when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he did lie down. He went over and he laid down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and she lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Yikes! Who are you, he asked. And Ruth says this, I'm your servant. I'm your servant, Ruth. It's interesting to note there that she calls herself a servant. It's the second time in the book that she said that she's Boaz's servant. But the first time in the book was chapter 2, where she says, Boaz, I am your Sifa. It's the Hebrew word for like lowest rung of of the ladder servant. Like the servant scum. You're way down here. And she says, I'm not even fit to be one of these kinds of servants to you. And she was right. As a widow and a foreigner, she wasn't fit to even be hired. But she, she was. Boaz gave her that grace. Here in this text, she changes the word that she uses to refer to herself. She's not a Sifa anymore. She's an Ama. An Ama is at the other end of the ladder. It's someone who is esteemed by the, the master. Someone who is almost seen as family. And she says, I am your family. I'm your servant. I'm your humble you know, s- s- server, but I am part of your family. And she says, I'm Ruth. And then she, she gives a proposal. Here it is. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are my kinsman redeemer. Here's the big risk. She just puts it out there. She's having the DTR conversation. (laughs) Let's define this thing. Define the relationship. You familiar with that? Anyway, all right. She says, here's what I hope from our relationship. My expectations for you are this. I want you to spread your garment over me and become my husband. The word there, garment, is actually a word that we see also in the text. It's earlier in chapter 2 where Boaz is praying for Ruth. And he says to Ruth, may God spread his wing over you. Wing and garment are the same words. It just depends on the context in which they're used. And so what Ruth is in essence doing, she's saying, hey, Boaz, I want you to be the, your answer to your prayer. I want you to be my wing. 
spread your garment over me. It's actually this picture that we see uh, of the veil in the, in the wedding uh, ceremony. Uh, in the old ceremonies 3,000 years ago, uh, a husband would bring his own garment, his own whatever, shawl or something like that. And at the end of the wedding ceremony, when the woman was betrothed to him, he would take his garment and he would put it over the woman. It was kind of like putting on a letterman's jacket. Back when we were dating in high school, I'm his property. I'm, this is my boyfriend or my husband in this sense. And isn't that a great picture? I wish I had time to preach this, but isn't that a great picture of what Jesus does for us? Jesus, if you don't know in Scripture, is referred to as the groom. He's the bridegroom. And he has come to us, his followers, and we're the bride. And he, he has basically bound himself to us. He is, he is with us, and we are with him, and we are one in the same way that a husband and wife are one. And he takes us and he clothes us, it says in the New Testament. He clothes us in what? righteousness, and he, he, he gives us his righteousness, and he makes us his own. And apart from him, we cannot be with the holy God, because the holy God sees us in our sin, and we are abominable to him, but because of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, we are now united with Jesus, and before God, we are blameless because we are clothed in the righteousness that Jesus has given us. Isn't that great? I mean, that's the gospel. And Boaz, like we've been pointing out, he's a Jesus figure, and Ruth represents the rest of us. We're <laughs> foreigner, widows, sinners, unclean, dirty, and in desperate need. And just as Boaz redeems her, Jesus has redeemed us, and all glory be to him. Amen? But she says to him, hey, take this garment and, and, and make me yours. I want you to be my kinsman redeemer. Uh, Boaz says this, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. He's referring to her character again. She says, he says, man, you're just blowing me away. You are so kind to Naomi to travel with her back here to Bethlehem. You are so kind to go out in the fields and glean so that the two of you can eat. And now you've come to me, an old man. Boaz was probably 50, maybe 60 years old. He was an old man, unmarried. He probably wasn't looking all svelte and cool, okay? Probably had a little pot belly, all right? But he says, you know, you've chosen me out of all the men that you could have chosen. And I am, I am, I'm, I'm in awe of the fact that you would choose me. He was uh, totally out of his league. He had outkicked his uh, punt coverage here. All right, um, it says, you have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. I guess uh, one of the things that would happen back then with the widows who would come to the land is that they would take whoever would take them. And all you young, young ladies, look at me one more time. Uh, Glenn Schubert was just telling me back there, he used to always tell his girls, don't go for Mr. Right now, go for Mr. Right. And there is this tendency in our world, ladies, for us to settle. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat in my office uh, and, and counseled with young women who, uh, if I had been there at the time when they started dating, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I would have told them never to start. But here they are, deep into a relationship with them, preceding marriage, or now married to them. And they're coming in and they're describing their, their, you know, their chosen one, this, this person they've tied their wagon to, as being Satan incarnate. And I want to sit there and I just want to shake it and be like, why'd you start that? If they're not dating, they, you know, they look at me through tears like, what should I do? And I'm like, call him right now. Dump him. <laughs> kick, that, he, kick him to the curb. He's bad news. How did you get there? I don't know. I love them. I don't care. <laughs> Stop. But you know what happens, ladies? We, let's our, we let our hearts get going. We get all enthralled with the prospects of a romantic, you know? And all of a sudden, our hearts are dragging, out around our places, or dragging us around to places where our heads would never have taken us if we just thought for a second about who this guy really is. Listen, ladies, you wait for a godly man who seeks to honor him above anybody else, including you, in his life. You wait for a man who can provide for you and uh, himself. You wait for a man who will put you first. I'm describing a very small pool of men. I recognize this. <laughs> but you wait for him. And fellas, you be that man. If you don't learn anything else from coming to this church, if you're a single guy, you get your stuff together. And you be honoring to God and you be available to a good, godly Christian woman so that the two of you can get together and glorify him with your lives. Amen. 
Don't jump at the first beating heart and breathing soul you see. He says, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I'll do all that you ask. Answer to prayer. Remember Naomi prayed? I pray that you find a husband. And there is Boaz committing. I'm your guy. Everything that you're, let me be your answer to prayer. You got me. He goes on and he says this. He says, 